Hello, it's Michael E. Gerber speaking to you again from Carlsbad, California, the land that God created just for you and just for me. Welcome to Awakening the Entrepreneur Within. Today's time is going to be an electric experience for you because the man that I'm going to be meeting with, Rob Teschner, called Cujo by the folks who flew with him throughout the world, a true top gun hero of all time. And today, a truly remarkable new entrepreneur pursuing with his book, with his process, with the great learning that he's done in the field, in the Air Force, over the past whatever number of years, is now being brought to you through his great new book called Debrief to Win. And you got to understand that nobody I ever say Debrief to Win has any idea of how absolutely critical the debrief process is to managing, to leading, to growing, to winning at anything you do. So I'm absolutely thrilled to say welcome, Kujo. Welcome to Awakening the Entrepreneur Within. Well, thank you so much, Michael. It is truly, and people say this all the time, it's an honor to be here. This is a true honor to be here on your show as a young entrepreneur talking about the things that I do and the, and the information that I know. I, I'm so glad to know you, Michael. I'm so glad to be working with you, and I'm so glad to be here this evening with you. Well, thanks, Kujo. So I want to just get right into it. You know, everybody I'm sure who's watching us and listening to us remembers the old Top Gun movie, the movie about those Top Gun pilots, those ferocious fighters who, in fact, just exploded off of the screen and did those most remarkable things but I don't think really that very many people truly know that's a true story. Now understand, I don't mean that they were the true story. I mean the Top Gun movement was and is a true story and core to the extreme excellence that resides within our Air Force and in the wars we've been brought to fight. So please tell everybody here about your experience as a Top Gun leader and what it meant to you. Michael, first of all, my opportunity to fly fighter aircraft was an absolute dream come true, but you have to realize that when I was dreaming, in fact, if you go all the way back to 1986 when Top Gun came out, and I was a little boy sitting in a theater watching Maverick and Goose and Iceman and Slider and all those guys, Jester, do what they did. It set me on a path that that allowed me to unleash my soul, right? This is what it was that I was designed to do. And I knew that as a young boy, but I wasn't the most athletic. Um, I didn't have a flying background. My father was an intelligence officer in the Air Force but I, I never flew an airplane until I went to the Air Force Academy. And I would argue that the first step of my evolution was to be, be, be taught by those that came before me using the Top Gun techniques to develop from a scrawny, non-athletic, non-flying background kind of a guy into a fighter pilot. One of the other things that I thought was really amazing- Let me say, let me say something just yeah. about that briefly. Sure. Because you're touching upon a really important subject related to every single person listening to us, every small business owner, everyone who decides they either have to go out on their own to make a living on their own, everybody who decides to become self-employed um, rather than going to work for another company, every single one of them find themselves in this terrible situation of really not having a clue what it means to own and operate, 
to design, build, launch, and grow a company, to become truly a star at it. So when you describe the fact that I was a scrawny kid, I never flew a plane before I joined the Air Force. And the greatest attribution I can give is to those great people who led me, taught me, trained me, inspired me to use the system, the techniques that they had practiced again and again and again and again. You got to understand everybody that what Rob has lived through, what Cujo has lived through, every single one of you are living through. But the degree to which he learned and absorbed and internalized those processes, those systems, that core passion and fire for what he was the, to set out to learn to do is so important to each and every one of you. So thanks for telling us that, Cujo. Go on with what you were saying. Absolutely. Well, so much like the entrepreneurs that are listening, that are tuning in today, I was this, I was this piece of clay that wanted to be molded into this thing that I knew existed, this thing called a fighter pilot. Just like now I'm this piece of clay that wants to be molded into a successful business owner who's working on the business and not in it. Um, and one of the things that I recognized early on is that those that are most successful are the ones that can offer me the best path to success. So I really paid attention to the top gun pilots in my squadron. And when they spoke, I looked at it as gospel. And when they taught, I tried to internalize the lessons that they taught. And I recognized early on that I was going to fail repeatedly and that that was going to be okay. And one of the beautiful things about the way that the fighter system works is we expect that our young members are going to fail repeatedly. And it's only through failure that they're going to learn where the limits are. They're going to understand what it is that they can do, what's in the realm of the possible. And we're going to work with them collaboratively through regular debriefing to improve them to the point where they reach the pinnacle of whatever success is that they're going to reach. And that's, that's how I ended up here today. I spent years perfecting my art. I spent years learning tough lessons. I mean, Michael, a lot of the things that I learned as a young wingman at Eglin Air Force Base in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, hurt, it stunk, all right? But I also developed an understanding that it's okay. And if you keep on struggling at it and you keep on coming back and applying the lessons from the previous experiences, you're gonna push yourself um, and get to where it is that you wanna go. And eventually I got there. But you see, what you're speaking about now is redolent of the conversation I had last week with Justin Singletary. And Justin, Justin was an Army Ranger. He's now a profoundly successful entrepreneur. And he tells the story about how difficult it is to get his customers, who are small business owners, to apply themselves with the rigor that he learned to apply himself with as a ranger. Now, you know that in the Army, U.S. Rangers are like in the Navy, the U.S. Navy SEALs, and like in the Air Force, um, your top gun pilots um, are rare, rare, rare phenomenon. And the rarity of that phenomenon comes to something that Justin spoke about and you're speaking about, and it's that inner passion and commitment and determination to th thrive, to rise above, to aspire, to become better than you are. And every single time you go into the field, every morning when you wake up, you're facing the conflict between that aspiration and the part of you that simply wants to stay in bed. You understand, I know heroes aren't always heroic. 
But I know that there is a inner core of heroes, and I consider you, Gujo, a true hero, that that drive, that intensity, that love for the process is what distinguishes those folks you flew with and distinguishes every great entrepreneur on the planet from all the also rands. I had a perfect conversation yesterday with a student of mine. He's only 19 years old. He aspires to become an entrepreneur. He just started learning from me uh, what he needs to do and why he needs to do it, et cetera, and so forth. And so he was enrolled in Radical U. And I didn't discover until weeks later that he hadn't even completed the first week's session yet. And to him, it was just because, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. And I just ripped his skull, skull apart. You haven't done it yet? You will never succeed ever at this. I can't even imagine having the opportunity to enroll in Radical U and not even completing the first session after weeks have gone by? You can't be a hero and be like that. So what's missing? What's missing is the passion to study from those who know. The passion to study from those who know. And you're one of those who know, Cujo. So tell me about passing it on. Because obviously you grew because others passed it on to you. But they didn't just arbitrarily pass it on to you. They passed it on through a system, a rigor, a process that, in fact, you had to abide by. Otherwise, get the hell out. Talk about all right. that. All right, Michael, first of all, to the hero point, if I may. I'd <laughs> like to express my thanks to you for those kind words, but on behalf of all of those who are serving us forward today, in the hot spots of the globe to make sure that you and I can be here communicating to one, one another. I, I would deflect that hero moniker to them, all right? Um, so that's the but first Every thing. single time I talk to you, you do. So <laughs> I knew that even when I said that. The second point, the <laughs> second point is, is that I know exactly what you're talking about with your, with your young student. And to him, I would say, why are you here? What, what is your core why? In my case, I knew that I wanted to be outstanding at what I did. And that meant complete dedication. There was no other option. But I was 100% certain that I knew why I was there. There was no doubt, no hesitation whatsoever. And that informed my approach to where I followed and I learned and I learned. Now, to your question about passing this on, in my evolution, one of the things that I'm most thankful for is that I had outstanding leaders who recognized that somewhere in this lump of coal was a diamond that could be, that could be elicited. And so they kept on working on me and they kept on working on me. And when I stumbled and fell, they kept on working on me and they believed in me to the point where at some point when I evolved into a decent fighter pilot, they said, all right, this was worth it. And they moved me forward. That affected me profoundly. Having a chance to go to the Air Force Fighter Weapons School, I, mean, that, I looked at, at its graduates as the Jedi Knights of my, of my profession. So to be admitted into their circle was an honor beyond anything that I could comprehend. And I've always looked at it as a blessing and a privilege. So the only thing that you can do with that kind of information, that kind of training, that kind of skill set, is to pass it on and to find the next version of yourself in the, in the group of people that's coming behind you. That's how we continue to have a 
an outstanding Air and Space Force, and that's the United States Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, Army, and the Coast Guard all working together to defend our great nation. You've got to keep on investing in the next generation. You have to keep on building new leaders. You've got to keep on inspiring them to have that same passion that you had when you were going through your evolution, and you can't ever let up on that. And this is the part, Michael, that I miss so much about my previous life, is that that, that passion was shared and everybody kept on working towards helping the next generation be just as good or better than we were. But you see, you had the wonderful reality that um, was called a fighter pilot. You had a uniform, you had a dress code, you had rules to abide by. As rigid and as purposeful as the highest form of religion. In short, you honored and respected those rules, that habit, those rituals that you became so identified with that you lived them within your heart. You spoke them every single day in one form or another. You insisted upon them with the people you led. In short, your experience in the military wasn't always kind, meaning the guys you reported to weren't always, in quotes, friends. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a human endeavor, right? So you're going to have different personalities. You're going to have constant struggles of not having enough resources, not having enough time, uh, not having all of the things that you need to get the job done, and that creates a pressure cooker. Then you amplify that by deploying to hot spots and going to places that you wouldn't otherwise go to, and it can be a challenge. One of the things that's nice about coming through that kind of a system is, is that the pressure creates bonds and, and really helps teams to form in ways that you can't fully describe and ways that can never be broken. So the, the, the friends that I started out with at the Air Force Academy who became part of the teams that I served on later on we created these indelible bonds that will last until we're done here on earth. And sometimes the stresses of working for a tough boss or a, a difficult commander helped amplify that and helped us to bond even closer. And, um, and I always think back on that as being good. So one of the takeaways from that is in all adversity is an opportunity to be resilient and an opportunity to learn and to grow. Uh, from, the, from the negative lessons, come opportunities to not repeat. And at the same time, when you're working for the outstanding, and I was blessed, Michael, the commanders that I worked for throughout my Air Force career were uniformly outstanding. I just hoped to be half the, half the commander that they were when I was given the privilege to do so. And I'm not, I'm not saying that um, as a platitude. I, I mean that seriously. I was, I was very privileged to have uh, an outstanding system to grow under all the way through until the end. I understand, and I absolutely know that you're sincere when you say that, and that you're not just making nice, so to speak. But I also know that you lived under tense, tense life and death circumstances where you never felt you had enough resources to do the job that was expected of you not just expected of you, but demanded of you. And so something within you had to respond to that. And that something in you wasn't the kindness of the circumstances that you were in, but exactly the opposite. So the steadfast nature of your persistence, that incredible, I don't know what, to call it other than intelligence, 
that incredible intelligence that drove you through those impossible situations to come out of them whole was a very serious part of the success that you had. And the absence of that is the ever present absence of that spirit, of that intelligence, of that uncanny ability to rise above every negative circumstance and to go better and go it better and go it better. So I'm just, I'm just a fan. So you'll, you'll excuse my enthusiasm, my unbridled enthusiasm and respect for you and for those who do what you do and still do. Um, it's just remarkable to me. And it's just so inspirational to me. I wish we could have that presence in everything we do with every client we do it for, with every business owner, with every aspiring entrepreneur. I wish they had to go through what you had to go through just to survive the process let alone to succeed at it. That's what it means to me. So I want to thank you for that. Well, thank you kindly, Michael. And, and, and remember, you know, you go back to the core of what it is that allows us to do the things that we do consistently, do it safely, to do it professionally. And it all comes back to the core training model that we've employed since World War I, all right? So when you talk about a pressure point, when you talk about a really difficult circumstance, when you talk about a near-death experience, after you survive, you come back and you follow the debrief methodology to figure out why did we get ourselves into this position and how do we avoid it ever happening again? And I'll tell you, this whole way of looking at, at the professional side of things, so, so military aviation, high performance organization type uh, operations. It goes back to World War I. We learned in World War I that if you were flying by yourself, you were gonna get shot down, typically by somebody that was coming in from behind where you couldn't see, usually out of the sun. We learned that if we flew together and provided each other mutual support, we could pick up the enemy at our friend's six o'clock behind them where they couldn't see, and they could do the same for us. That lesson came out of the debriefs from the early 1900s, and it taught us that there's value to planning what it is we're gonna go do, to communicating the plan to the members of our team so that we're all on the same sheet of music, to executing to the best of our ability, and then to coming back and debriefing what happened all the way through, from planning all the way through to the end of execution, so that we're constantly learning we're constantly bringing in new members into our tribe who don't have the same experience that we do, but we're rapidly getting them to the same level and we're always improving. It sounds absolutely too simple to be true, but like most really profound things in life, it's powerful. It's absolutely powerful. And I remember, Michael, there was, as an illustration of this, there was a time, it was a training mission, is out over the Atlantic Ocean probably 115 or so miles uh, away from Langley Air Force Base. We were doing a dog fighting mission, which meant it's one V one, myself and my teammate, we're gonna pretend that we're on opposite sides and we're gonna, we're gonna get about five miles away from each other. We're gonna turn in, we're gonna scream at one another with a closing velocity of over 2000 miles an hour. We're gonna merge, meaning we're gonna pass outside of 500 feet from one another and try and maneuver into a position to employ our weapons and, and may the best pilot win. <laughs> on, that, on that particular day, Michael, I'm flying against a, a reasonably experienced pilot, a good American who really cares about what he's doing. Every time that I pointed to get my 500 foot spacing, he pointed in the exact same spot. 
Now remember, closing velocity around 2,000 miles an hour, I point away, he point back at that spot. And after a few of these, there's no doubt in my mind that we're gonna hit. Mm. And at the last second, we do, we both do really severe maneuvers in the airplane to try and avoid that, that, that hit. And as he goes by my, by my aircraft on the right side, time slows down. I mean, it absolutely slows down. And I can see each individual rivet underneath his airplane go past my cockpit just a couple of feet away. And I'm not making any of this up. I can see each individual rivet. I've never paid attention to the rivets during any of my walk around. They're <laughs> going by my cockpit over here. And I turn around because I'm afraid that he's hit my tails. I'm amazed that we didn't hit, but I'm afraid that he's shaved off my tails and that I won't be able to fly home. He misses me. The first thing that we do, Michael, is we stop fighting. We turn off all of our combat related systems. I bring them back into formation so that we can double check each other's aircraft to make sure that truly everything's still there that's supposed to be there. And we race back home not to blame each other or to shame each other or to, or to point fingers at one another, but just to figure out why did this happen so that it can never happen again. And part of that message is to share with the rest of the members of our team what happened so that they can learn from our lessons so that they don't go out there and repeat it. We had plenty of gas available that day. We could have continued to fight. We don't fly often enough. It would have been nice to go and get a, a couple more engagements in. But the danger of doing so without understanding why we almost hit, not worth it. Absolutely not worth it. Now expand that to large force employment, hundreds of airplanes in the same piece of sky. Take that forward into combat. Every single mission ends with a debrief where if we're successful, we figure out why so that we can replicate it. And if we're not successful, we figure out why so that we can improve. Again, so profoundly simple. But guess what? It works. And it's the, mo the debrief, Michael, is truly the most important part of any mission that we fly. It's where we learn. And if you spend an hour in the sky, you might spend two or three hours debriefing that hour in the sky to, 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 to draw as much as you can from that experience so that you can then take the lessons and apply them the next time that you go plan for the next time that you go fly. It, and every single time you do that, you sharpen the minds, the awareness, the attention, the physicality, the psychological reality of every single person there in that debrief. Yes. It can be, I know, as intense as anything that happened in the air. Yes. And to then take that back out with you and then to renew it and renew it and renew it, it's an extraordinary system. I see it as a system. I see it as a process. Yes. I see it as an absolutely critical component of the totality of what one does within the Air Force you lived in, you breathed in, you fought in, you trained in, you managed in, you led in, you taught in, et cetera, and so forth, and you aspired within. Yes. Rising, 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 rising. I just want to thank you so much, Cujo, for being here with us today. I'm going to tell every single person who's listening to us, read Cujo's book, Debrief to Win. It's a stunning book, a literally stunning book. It is a fundamental book underlying all management, all leadership in any kind of venture, enterprise, organization whatsoever. And to not read it would be like not to learn how to fly the plane you're setting out to fly. So Cujo, thank you. I love you being here. We'll speak to you again. Michael, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to spend some time with you here today. I'm thankful to you for your support since the first time we met several years ago. I thank you for writing the forward to the book that you just talked so warmly about. Uh, and I would say to your audience, uh, you are 
the exact right audience for what it is that we're talking about because you have that passion, that entrepreneurial passion to go forth and to build something and to leave a legacy and to do good in this world. If you figure out now how to improve continuously while you're doing that, there's, there's truly no limit for you. And the final thing that I'll say is to the men and women that are giving us the opportunity to do what we're doing here today, a profound thank you. And I'm convinced of the fact that the men and women that are flying the fighters that I used to fly are doing so better than I did because they've improved since my time in uniform. And I'm so thankful for that and to have been a part of that. God bless you, Michael. God bless you, Kujo. Thank you. Thank you. So, folks, this session was obviously about so many things that we feel are so critical to your success. And that is to truly wear the colors, to truly internalize the passion at the heart of your mission that you're setting out with a dream, a vision, a purpose, and a mission. You're setting out as a dreamer, a thinker, a storyteller, a leader. You're setting out to transform the state of small business and entrepreneurship and economic development worldwide. That's what we're here to do together. So join me in Radical U. Join me in the only entrepreneurial development school on the planet. Join me and do the work week by week by week by week. And you'll discover what Cujo discovered as he rose from the ranks to aspire to go higher than he ever imagined he could. You can do the very same. I want to thank you all for joining us. This is Michael Lee Gerber speaking to you from Carlsbad, California, the land that God created just for you and just for me. See you next time. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.